As South Korea braces for a new COVID-19 wave, starting today, eligibility for the second COVID-19 booster has been lowered from those in their 60s to 50 years old and above. Those over 18 with a weakened immune systems are eligible as well. South Korea's foreign minister is set to depart for a diplomatic trip to Japan. With a new government's goal of improving on current frosty relations with its neighbor, what will be on his agenda? A Ukrainian military official says Russia is preparing for the next stage of its offensive in Ukraine. As Ukraine puts Western deliveries of arms to use on the battlefield, Russia's shelling intensifies along all front lines. Good morning and welcome to New Day at Arirang. We begin with COVID-19 this morning. Starting today, more people will be able to receive their second COVID-19 booster. Previously, only people aged 60 and above and those with weak immune systems were eligible. But now, people aged 50 or older, adults with pre-existing health conditions and those living in facilities for the disabled and the homeless will have access to the second booster. Health officials recommend that people get the jab at least four months or 120 days after their last dose. Reservations for the new round of vaccinations open on Monday, with shots being administered from August 1st. However, those able to book leftover vaccine shots can get their booster earlier than this date. South Korea has expanded the eligibility of second booster shots as COVID-19 figures creep up. As of 9 p.m. on Sunday, the country logged 25,079 new infections, which was double the amount reported last week. South Korea's Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Chu Gyeong-ho says a high inflation rate above 6% could continue into September and October. However, he added that inflation is unlikely to sharply exceed the 6% mark for a significantly long period of time. Chu made the com comments at the G20 meeting of finance ministers and central bank chiefs in Bali, Indonesia, where he also sat down with the head of the International Monetary Fund, who projected a grim outlook for the global economy. The IMF chief also hinted that the agency intends to further cut its growth forecast for major economies during its next review. South Korea and Japan may be on the brink of a first diplomatic breakthrough in nearly five years. South Korean Foreign Minister Park Jin will visit Japan on Monday for three days, where he will meet his counterpart Yoshimasa Hayashi. Local news agencies say that there's also a very high chance that Park will meet with, his, meet with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida and resume diplomatic talks that have been stalled for four years and seven months. The last time such talks took place was in December 2017. For years now, the two countries have failed to come to an agreement on historical issues, mainly compensation for Korean victims of forced labour during J Japanese colonisation. The ruling party and the government have vowed all-out efforts to fight inflation and the debt burden on people in South Korea. Among items discussed during a meeting on Sunday were plans to switch to fixed-rate mortgages for some homeowners and resumption of a currency swap deal with the United States. Lee young has the details. Amid rising inflation and interest rates, President Yoon suk yeols ruling People Power Party and the government met on Sunday to cushion the impact on people. At top of their agenda is easing the burden on homeowners. The government will enable homeowners to switch from a variable to a fixed rate mortgage if their home is worth less than 300,000 US dollars starting September. More details are to follow, but the party spokesperson said the current plan is to keep the interest rate at 4% rate instead of some 5 to 6% that's expected at the current pace. And the party and the government are also reviewing a currency swap with the U.S. to stabilize volatility in the market. Last Friday, the Korean won fell to its lowest point against the dollar in 13 years and two months, prompting calls for a resumption of the currency swap with the US that's been on hold since the previous administration. In regards to gas prices, the government will decide where to cut fuel taxes further than the current 37 percent after monitoring global oil prices that have recently started to go down. Meanwhile, the government is going to swiftly permit the entry of some 50,000 foreign workers to ease manpower shortages in the agricultural and manufacturing sectors and ultimately help stabilize prices. 
On the COVID-19 front, the government reaffirmed it will be taking science-based measures to tackle the resurgence. The government will do its best to protect people's lives based on data and expert advice. And those measures will be largely focused on vaccination and treatment, not social distancing. The PM called for the swift administration of four shots, specifically for those over 50 years old or with chronic diseases. Meanwhile, the government will secure treatments for some 940,000 people by the first half of next year. Young Eun, Arirang News. The South Korean government is going to raise the limit on goods that can be brought into the country duty-free from the current 600 U.S. dollars to 800 dollars to help duty-free retailers hit by the pandemic. Finance Minister Chu Gyeong-ho announced the plan on Saturday, speaking to reporters in Bali, Indonesia, where he has been attending the G20 finance minister's meeting. Also a measure to stabilize the bond market and the Korean currency, he said the government's going to eliminate taxes on interest and capital gains from Korean government bonds and monetary stabilization bonds for non-residents and foreign companies. This could also help Korea get the FTSE Russell World Government Bond Index, which would further encourage foreign investment. Now turning to the war in Ukraine. The Ukrainian military says Kremlin's military leaders have ordered the country's troops to further intensify their actions in all areas. This comes as newly supplied Western weapons help Ukraine on the battlefield. Kim Yo sun has more. Russia is reportedly preparing for the next stage of its offensive in Ukraine. That's according to a spokesperson for Ukrainian military intelligence, who explained that Moscow said its forces would step up military operations in all operational areas. The officials said that they have been witnessing shelling along the entire front line, noting that there is an active use of technical aviation and attack helicopters. In recent days, Russian rockets have pounded Ukrainian cities, leaving dozens dead. Fresh attacks have been reported across Ukraine lately, with at least three people killed in a Russian missile attack in the country's central city of Dnipro last Friday. During the past weeks, Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, was also hit by a barrage of missiles. The Ukrainian military also says that Moscow appears to be regrouping units for an offensive towards Slovyansk, an important city held by Ukraine in the eastern Donetsk region. The development comes as Western deliveries of long-range arms begin to help Ukraine on the battlefield. Kim Yo-san, Arirang News. It's time for On Point, where we speak to experts to delve deeper into some of the key issues in the spotlight right now. Google's in-app purchase policy has been the cause of some complaints from app, app developers in South Korea recently due to a 30% in-app purchase commission with a ban on showing alternative payment methods for apps. And one of South Korea's biggest IT companies, Kakao, went up against Google, showing an alternative link that directs users to a website to pay outside the Google app and avoid the 30% commission. Last week, this battle between the two IT giants came to a close as Google refused to update Kakao applications on Android phones, and the South Korean messaging app gave in and took down the link. So where is this fight headed, and can we declare Google the winner? For more, we have Professor Kim Yong-jin at Sogang University's Business School with us. Good morning. Good morning. Well, first off, we only gave the gist of what's going on, but could you explain this agreement a little further from an expert's point of view? And is this the end of the fight? Have Kakao ultimately lost for maybe even representing the other apps? Yeah, but you know, you explained well about the fight between Google and Kakao applications. Um, it has been expected you know, after the revision of Telecommunications Business Act um, in August 2021 and Google's announcement um, in this April. Google clarified that um, all in-app developers who are selling their product, digital product and services in Google's store um, are required to use Google payment um, system only. And even though the alternative payment method are allowed, the developers um, shall not provide outlink to the alternative payment website. Kakao applications um, provided an alternative link that direct 
uh, to a website for users to go and pay a cheaper price outside of the uh, Google app. Um, Kakao did it for good, but violated Google's you know, policy. Um, when it comes to the conclusion of the fight, um, in, the, in the situation where Google and Apple have a monopolist market power of 90% in the app market here in Korea and global alike, it is not easy for you know other app developers to refuse to use you know App Store or Google Play Store. That means the fight over in-app purchase almost finished to make the two marketplace giant winners. And Professor, well, it does come as quite a surprise, really, because the South Korean Parliament, they actually passed a law uh, which was the first of its kind in the world to actually restrict Google from only having in-app options. And, well, why doesn't it appear to be working? And could you also explain what the law was? Well, um, as you mentioned, you know, this is the first uh, of its kind in the world. Um, South Korean National Assembly uh, revised uh, uh, the Telecommunication Business Act to include uh, three items in Article 50, which is about a prohibited act. Uh, the items include, um, are included are about the prohibited act of the um, app uh, market operators, such as the forced use of specific you know, uh, payment method, the delay of, of you know, uh, app publication review, and the uh, cancellation of listed apps. Uh, after this revision, uh, a revision of the law in August 2000, uh, 2021, uh, Google responded to set up a new policy with uh, regard to in-app purchase, which allows alternative payment method, but not allow developers to promote the payment method by providing button, link, and message about them. At the same time, Apple and Google started charging 26% of commission on the apps purchase through alternative payment method, which totally nullified the regulation newly introduced. There's no difference. Either you use in-app purchase or alternative um, payment method in terms of commission. You know, they always have the other ways to uh, circumvent the regulations. Right, they always, like you said, have the ways to go around the law, but South Korea was the first one to put this kind of law in place. Right. Uh, but how does it work outside of South Korea? It must be an issue everywhere else in the world. As you said, they have 90% of the market share. Exactly, exactly. Uh, not only in Korea, the US and EU uh, also have similar problems. In the US, Epic Games sued Google over the cancellation of their mobile game, what is called Fortnite, uh, from Google Play. Um, you know, due to the fact that Epic Games uh, provided alternative payment method outside of Google Play Store to avoid 30% of commission, uh, other companies, including Spotify, Meta, Microsoft, and Next, uh, supported Epic Games. After this lawsuit, Google and Apple a little bit stepped back uh, to cut commission by 15% for small and medium uh, developers uh, whose yearly revenue is less than $1 million and to provide support programs for them and to allow alternative payment method without direct link. In EU, Spotify sued Apple over antitrust act in that Apple gave favor to Apple Music by not charging 30% commission which is imposed to other competitors. A EU Commission is still investigating the issue. And speaking of Apple, Professor, could you uh, compare how the company is doing here in South Korea compared to Google's policies and how this really affects consumers? Right, right. Uh, that's a good question. Um, actually, the difference between Google and um, Apple, you know, caused by the different market position. Uh, Apple is the one who uh, invented the app marketplace in 2008. Um, the company was number one in the mobile application market. Google was the uh, fast follower. Apple set up uh, the in-app purchase in 2011 and has charged a 30% commission from that time. Developers you know, who did not have any channel or outlet 
to sell their app uh, to make money at the time applauded Apple's you know, app store and its in-app purchase policy. So Apple did not have much problems. However, Google you know, could not impose the in-app purchase policy um, to all uh, developers because it had to gather more developers and more users uh, to catch up with Apple. So the company charged uh, the commission only on game developers. Um, with enough number of developers and users now, the company tried to change the route. This change in the um, in-app purchase policy causes huge turmoil around the world. Now, even though uh, the time is a little bit different, both companies face similar problems with regard to the in-app purchase due to the monopolist power uh, of them in the market. Well, thank you so much for your insights. They were very, very specific and valuable to us. We look forward to speaking you again, to you again soon and have a great morning. Uh, have a good morning and thanks for having me. And that wraps up the first half of New Day at Arirang. But stick around coming up in the second half. We're going to be discussing U.S. President Joe Biden's recent trip to the Middle East and whether he was able to achieve what was intended during his trip. So do stay tuned to Arirang News. experience in Japan from the IP and introduced the Korean New Day. The Korean survivor of Japan's wartime sex slavery met with... Extraordinary with climate crisis pledged to work with the EU to tackle the challenge. The objective of its North Korea policy is... Protests is gathering across the country to peacefully demand an end to hate and violence. Arika, what matters? Welcome back to New Day at Arirang. A deadly heat wave is suffocating countries in Europe and has caused wildfires in France, Spain and Portugal. Even Britain is bracing itself for what could be the hottest temperatures ever recorded there in the coming days. Our Kim Bogyang with more. A life-threatening heat wave in Europe. Centered on countries in Europe's southwest, the heat has caused wildfires and deaths. For days now, Spain has seen temperatures as high as 45.7 degrees Celsius or 114 degrees Fahrenheit. 
In the past week, according to the Carlos III Health Institute, it's caused at least 360 heat-related deaths. The extreme heat is also bringing wildfires. A fire in Spain's Extremadura region close to the Portuguese border has burned around 3,000 hectares and forced people to evacuate. Here we're fighting, and what else can we do? I'm quite devastated, to be honest. It's a similar situation in France, where more than a thousand firefighters have been battling wildfires in the Jihon region. More than 12,200 people have been forced to evacuate as of Saturday morning. The fires had reportedly burned nearly 10,000 hectares as of Saturday. But the heat wave in western France has forecast to reach its peak on Monday at above 40 degrees Celsius. Other countries are also bracing for extreme heat. The British government has issued a red heat warning for the first time as temperatures in the United Kingdom are expected to soar as high as 40 degrees Celsius on Monday and Tuesday. The highest temperature ever recorded in Britain was 38.7 degrees Celsius that was in Cambridge on July 25, 2019. We were putting in extra measures in terms of call handlers, uh, support for fleet, uh, extra uh, hours of capacity within the ambulances and I was discussing with the ambulance chief execs the specific measures that they're taking. Though extra measures are in the works, officials are expressing concern over the healthcare system already challenged by the COVID-19 pandemic. Kim Bo-kyung, Arirang News. Seoul Queer Culture Festival took place over the weekend with a parade on Saturday. But right outside the event, conservative groups staged large protests against the festival and the LGBTQ community. Our reporter Kim Hyun-sung was there to witness the whole event. Rainbow-colored flags in the heart of Seoul. Seoul Queer Culture Festival has come back in full after being disrupted by the pandemic over the past two years. In central Seoul's Chungu district on Saturday, people marched with pride. And as if to make up for lost time, a huge crowd has flocked to Seoul Plaza in support of LGBTQ rights. But right outside the fence that's surrounding Plaza, some Christian and conservative groups are staging protests and the demonstrators are so loud that their sound is overpowering the sounds within the festival. <laughs> Actually, my parents go to church, and their church is also protesting outside, so it's just a shame. Police lines were deployed in case tensions escalated and to keep people safe. But despite protests, the Pride movement has grown year after year. Around 135,000 people attended this year's festival. Around 20 years ago, when we first did the parade, around 200 to 300 people took part in the parade. So we've grown a lot in 20 years. As more people came out with their sexualities, support also grew. Allies, Buddhist monks and family members began to take part in the event as well. So I wanted to express my solidarity with the people of this community here in Korea and show that there's, there's an opportunity to make change. We're giving out these five coloured bracelets because, like these colours that become more beautiful when mixed together, our society will become happier and healthier if we embrace people with different sexual identities and preferences. My kid is transgender, but when I look at our society, so many people just hate and oppress sexual minorities when they don't know anything about them. I came here because I wanted to help. The day of the parade was hot, humid and rainy. But that didn't stop the long tail of people marching with pride. The festival will go on until the end of this month, with Queer Film Festival hosting movie screenings this Friday to Sunday. Kim Hyun-sung, Arirang News. It's time for Global Insight, where we speak to experts from around the world on issues making headlines. 
After a four-day trip to the Middle East on a mission to win oil and security commitments for America, United States President Joe Biden finished his tour without much to show for. The leader had aimed to win speedy increases in oil production, a regional security architecture that normalizes Israeli Arab ties against the backdrop of soaring energy prices, hurting U.S. consumers, and Washington's strategic competition with Beijing and Moscow. But with the U.S. having been pulling out of the region and turning to the Indo-Pacific, many see its influence waning in the Middle Eastern countries, which are now being courted by both China and Russia. So how much of a concern are these dynamics for the United States and how is Washington going to address this? To discuss this issue, we have joining us today Kim Yang-gyu, Principal Researcher at the East Asia Institute and Kurosh Diabari, Asia Times Journalist and the 2022 World Press Institute Fellow. Thank you both so much for joining us this morning. Very early hours in uh, Iran for you, Mr Diabari. But, well, my first question to you, Professor Kim. Now, throughout this trip, all eyes were on whether President Biden could secure some kind of Israeli-Saudi cooperation and, of course, uh, an a very speedy increase in oil production uh, in the foreseeable future. Would you say that he has failed in his mission? Well, I'm not sure whether President Biden managed to get what he wanted. He summarized six accomplishments of his visit to Saudi Arabia on July 15th, opening Saudi airspace to Israel, transferring to control Tiran Island in the Red Sea, to Iriad, and ceasefire in Yemen, and so on. But I'm not saying all these issues are not important, but all, we all know, as you already mentioned, that the main reason for his visit to Saudi Arabia was oil, in addition to avoiding the power vacuum in the Middle East. The U.S. is facing a $5 a gallon gasoline price, a pretty bad political liability, especially for the coming midterm election in November. But the joint statement after the United States and the Gulf Cooperation Council GCC countries summit did not mention much except for welcoming OPEC Plus's decision to increase oil supply over the course of July and August, which was released already in June. Saudi Arabia and the UAE are the only countries with spare capacity to produce more oil now. Unfortunately, according to Biden, Saudi did not promise anything besides sharing the urgencies to increase the supply. But regarding the second goal of his visit, securing strategic alignment, I think President Biden was successful. The establishment of combined task force 153 and task force 59 to enhance interoperability and joint defense coordination between GCC member states and the, U and the U.S. Central Command will send a strong message to China and Russia. And Professor Kim, well, the, uh, his meeting with the Saudi Crown Prince began with a bit of an awkward uh, fist bump that was widely criticized <laughs> around the world. And Well, P Mr. Biden, he previously said that he's going to make Saudi Arabia a pariah and said that you know, the regime would pay the price for the murder of Washington Post journalist uh, Jamal Khashoggi. But what was your take of Mr. Biden's engagement with MBS? So, uh the fist bump was criticized a lot, and actually, actually a lot of uh, reporters asked him about the question after the, the summit. But he uh, continues to mention that his main purpose is not about you know giving any uh, uh, solution or uh, uh, a pardon to uh, the the uh, the crown prince, but it's more about his strategic goal of securing uh, oil and about increasing the strategic alignment between the, these uh, important countries in the Middle East. So I think he tried to focus on the strategic element of the uh, story, uh, but we'll see how the other people respond to this. Uh, Mr. Ziavari, now bringing into the conversation, Mr. Biden uh, tried to deflect this criticism um, towards meeting and fist bumping the uh, Saudi de facto leader over the murder of the Washington Post journalist, of course. And well, Mr. Biden said that he brought up the issue and that he's been clear about human rights and continues to be clear about it. But uh, despite the human rights and the political concerns between the two countries, it seems that Washington does need the kingdom after all, both as a hedge against Iran Iran and also as a source of oil. So how do you see the dynamics of um, the relationship between these two leaders? Uh, do you think human rights is going to continue being a sticking point between them? Um, of course, in a stark departure from the former U.S. President Donald Trump's stance on human rights, who had actually entirely sidelined um, any preference for a 
human rights advocacy and protection internationally, President Biden has actually brought back human rights to the conversation and is declaring uh, that he is vocal and is outspoken and is going to uh, actually take up the cudgels for all of those whose rights are being suppressed internationally. He said that he raised the murder of the uh, Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi in his meeting with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. But I guess, after all, um, uh, President Biden needs a strategic alliance with Saudi Arabia, as you said, uh, also to counter Iranian influence in the region. Uh, I understand that President Biden, uh, by the end of the day, will be uh, forfeiting his ideals for human rights advocacy in certain cases, especially when it comes to Saudi Arabia, because uh, not simply for the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, Saudi Arabia is one of the most profligate uh, practitioners of uh, death penalty in the world, and its human rights record has always been uh, blemished and uh, very troubling, but uh, we don't see much criticism coming out of the, uh, the White House about Saudi Arabia's continuous uh, pattern of human rights violations. Um, I understand that here uh, it's mostly um, political expediency and political correctness that will prevail rather than a genuine and um, fundamental commitment to human rights. Um, of course, um, President Biden is different from his predecessor, Donald Trump, who had simply marginalized the uh, idea of American leadership and advocacy for human rights. But uh, first, in order to um, make sure that uh, the United States has a, a reliable partner in the Persian Gulf region, and also to uh, counter the rising influence and the perceived threat from Iran, President Biden will uh, simply keep the uh, continuous pattern of Saudi Arabia's human rights violations under the wraps and stick to uh, the strategic partnership. We should also take into consideration that um, Saudi Arabia uh, does not really share many of the values and ideals and principles that the United States uh, stands for and represents. It's a very conservative uh, society, and there are not many commonalities between these two countries. If you look at the broader pattern of the, uh, the Iranian society's social dynamics and social fabric, we can see more uh, commonalities between mm -hmm. Iran and the United States, which can uh, actually lay the groundwork for a broader partnership, but that's not happening at the moment. Right. And well, given all these concerns, um, given all the criticism that Mr. Biden faced uh, from US media and also human rights activists, do you think he managed to get enough out of this trip? And also, what was, it, what was in it for the Saudi crown prince? Uh, I think President Biden, uh, well, I don't prefer to see his trip to the Middle East in binary terms to say whether it was a success or it was a failure. But I think uh, he has been able to reassert the United States leadership in the Middle East to make sure that uh, it's, uh, his Arab partners across the Persian Gulf understand that the United States is not pulling out of the Middle East entirely in order to uh, pave the way for Russia or China to fill the vacuum or for Iran to exert its influence and fill the void. Uh, so in, in that sense, President Biden has been able to uh, cobble together an alliance that might be useful in the, in the long run, especially after his meeting with the leaders of the Gulf Cooperation Council plus three other leaders from Arab countries. That was a, a momentum that he actually uh, uh, created. Um, and so it, it can be one of the positive aspects of his trip. Uh, also, he's, uh, well, maybe he, uh, he might not have been able to secure the uh, petroleum and energy uh, dividends that he wanted to reap through his trip, including by uh, convincing Saudi Arabia to ramp up production uh, in order to decrease uh, global oil prices in the face of Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but I guess in the uh, near future, uh, that might be addressed as well. Saudi Arabia, uh, especially Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, have been given a new lease of life. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman has been able to be redeemed from the global isolation that he was suffering, especially after the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. So um, I think that, that, that it was relatively a successful trip for Biden. Some uh, people might disagree, but I think uh, he brought together the regional leaders, shared ideas, and uh, so um, I think uh, 
excluding his uh, failure to secure um, the uh, augmentation of oil production by Saudi Arabia to counter the trend of uh, rising sure. prices because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, his other uh, actually um, goals might have been realized. Right. So he did sign quite a lot of MOUs with uh, Saudi Arabia. So, uh, yeah, he didn't come back completely empty handed, of course. But Professor Kim, now, uh, this trip came against the backdrop of U.S. officials becoming growingly concerned that Iran is set to expand strategic cooperation with China and Russia. Do you, are you seeing such dynamics take shape? Well, absolutely. There are many reasons why Russia, China and Iran should deepen strategic cooperation among them. One, they share a common vision for the international order, respecting sovereignty, law of intervention, and building an anti-hegemonic multipolar system. They want to challenge the Western-dominated view of Western human rights and the liberal world order. Two, they have a common interest, regime stability and security. They don't like the U.S.-led unilateral sanction imposed on, in the name of the international community. They need to thwart uh, Western attempts to change the regimes. To do so, they need each other. Specific, specifically speaking, both Iran and Russia need China to neutralize the negative impact of international sanctions on their economies. And three, they worked through a common institution. In September last year, Iran became a full member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and Iran, Russia, and China now holding their joint naval drills in the, in the, ocean, in the India Ocean. So yes, the in Iran, China, Russia triangle is emerging and it will only get more intensified as we go through the Russia-Ukraine war. And Professor, while there's all this talk about a possible Middle Eastern NATO uh, popping up, what are your thoughts on this? Is this likely to take shape? Uh, Professor Kim. Oh, so um uh so the question was the iran is seeking the possible little middle east nato i say the middle east and nato how do you see the possibility of this group actually uh coming into shape well as uh the, mr jabari already mentioned that the uh now the u.s managed to gather all these uh, important leaders in, in the region and saudi arabia of course there are many issues and Biden said this very specifically that the, uh, uh, this issue has to be resolved and the, the President Biden will never just let it go uh, and he will maintain the importance of uh, human rights issues. And uh, the President Biden, what, what President Biden has emphasized is about, you know, coordinating all powers that share the uh, same value and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and norms. So maybe it is not going to be easy to build a strong uh, relations like they have in NATO or they have in the Pacific, they share the same democracy, the norm of democracy. Uh, but they will try, they say the area is very important strategically. So President Biden will try to find a way to legitimize their, their tie with the, the Iran, and so, I mean, the Iran and Saudi Arabia. And Mr. Siavari, I want to hear your thoughts on this. Um, all this talk about a Middle East NATO, is that going to put some pressure on Tehran or is it just going to drive it closer to Russia and China? Right. Uh, my understanding is that uh, at the moment, uh, the Arab countries of the region are not uh, really interested in a direct confrontation with Iran. And even the Saudi Foreign Minister, Prince bin Farhan, has uh, ruled out that there is going to be a military security coalition that is um, fundamentally uh, predicated on uh, uh, actually uh, going to take a fight against Iran. So um, even though the, the, there is a, a alliance, there is an alliance taking shape that might be uh, uh, germinating and might uh, be developing over time, uh, at the moment there is an approachment going on between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and also Iran is taking the initial steps to cozy up to Egypt, Jordan, and some of the Arab nations of uh, the Middle East and North Africa, with which it hasn't really maintained close and uh, amicable partnerships and relations over the past four decades. Uh, there is a possibility that the Middle Eastern Arab NATO might uh, be cobbled together and might uh, pop up at some point. But uh, at the moment, uh, the region is uh, pretty much imbued with turmoil and tensions and no country in the region even including Iran which uh, is actually known for its confrontational and aggressive foreign policy none of these part, uh, players are interested in a new episode of uh, tension uh, and um, mostly I my understanding is that the trend is uh, built on uh, 
a very slow, gradual, but progressive um, uh, embracing of rapprochement and reconciliation. So um, I, I understand that um, even uh, between Iran and United Arab, Arab Emirates, which hasn't had uh, um, an ambassador in Tehran for some years, especially after the attack by uh, an angry mob on the Saudi embassy in Tehran, which uh, led to the uh, cutting off of diplomatic ties between the two countries and the United Arab Emirates at that point withdrew its ambassador in Tehran. Now they are working with Tehran to appoint a new ambassador. So all of these indications are that uh, a regional uh, harmony is uh, right. uh, emerging, which is promising. Right, so regional stability is in everyone's interest. And well, the United States too saying, um, with Mr. Biden saying that uh, Washington will very much remain active in the region. And Professor Kim, my last question to you. So, well, ahead of the US midterm elections, Mr. Biden faces numerous foreign policy issues that are really fighting for his attention at the moment. And well, do you think he's going to increasingly turn his attention to the Middle East and energy issues as his voters grapple with record high inflation? And um, uh, amid these competing foreign policy interests, how, how is Mr. Biden going to balance all of these out? Well, this is a very important question. The, uh, the Biden administration is trying to build a strategic framework to connect the different regions that share the same values and norms, that, as I already mentioned. But all this framework, all this scheme could might just go away if Trump sits in the driver's seat again. The June Consumer Price Index shows a 9.1% increase in prices over the past 12 months, which is the highest number since 1981. And many experts say that it was mainly driven by the energy prices, especially the steep increase in diesel oil prices. And the energy, the diesel is important for agriculture and transportation for, of goods. So the rise in diesel prices put much pressure on the overall inflation level. And this hyperinflation was a grave challenge to the Biden administration. But there are a couple of good, good news and favorable conditions for him as well. The Supreme Court decision to overturn the women's right to an abortion, the tragic mass shooting incidents and the shocking report of the January 6th committee's investigation on what Trump did to cling to power. All these factors were favorable for Biden. So ultimately, this is going to be the decision of the borders of the United States. But if Demo Dem uh, Democrats win the November election, the result will buttress the Biden's foreign policy. He doesn't need to worry about how we're going to balance it out. A lot of things on his plate, both domestically and regarding foreign policy. And that was Kim Yang, principal researcher at the East Asia Institute and Kurosh Siabari, Asia Times journalist. Thank you both so much for your time this morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Ever since the U.S. Supreme Court overturned the Roe v. Wade ruling, many countries, including South Korea, have reassessed their own laws on abortion. Our Shin ye -un walks us through where South Korea stands in terms of abortion rights. Over the past five years, the National Police Agency has found over 600 abandoned infants. Of those, roughly 50 were killed. When these parents were asked why they thought they had no other choice, some said they weren't financially ready to raise a child. Some others said they thought abortion was illegal. But is this true? Is abortion illegal in South Korea? This is a tricky question. In 2019, the Constitutional Court of Korea decided to decriminalize abortion. They overturned two articles that had stood for 66 years. Under these articles, women were sentenced to up to one year in prison or given a $1,500 fine. The doctors can be sentenced to two years in prison. Though the criminal act has disappeared, a critical law related to abortion has remained. That's the Mother and Child Health Act, which states that abortion should only be done before the woman reaches week 24 of her pregnancy. And there are certain conditions that need to be met. For instance, the law only allows abortion when the woman or her spouse suffers from any genetic or mental handicap, or when the pregnancy was the result of rape or incest. Also, if the pregnancy itself is likely to have a negative impact on the person's health. Realizing that restrictions on abortions with no penalties can cause confusion, the Constitutional Court asked lawmakers to make amendments by December 31, 2020. 
But reaching consensus on such a divisive subject is no easy task. Some lawmakers are pushing for stricter abortion laws, like Seo jong suk who proposed an amendment to the Mother and Child Health Act so that only women who are up to 10 weeks pregnant can get an abortion. This side argues that human life starts as early as the fetus stage, and that by 10 weeks, the fetus already has bones and organs. Other lawmakers, like Kwon yin suk believe abortion is an issue that should be decided by the pregnant woman, not the government. Deciding up to which week you can get an abortion is insensible when the act has been decriminalized. Instead, we should be discussing how to make sure abortion operations are done safely. For instance, if we can include abortion into our national health insurance. The WHO has found that over 25 million unsafe abortions happen globally each year. Doctors said this may be from limited information on abortions. Unlike other medical procedures, there aren't lists showing which hospitals provide abortions and their general price. Even when I called a few gynecologists in Seoul, they all had different answers. Regardless of their opinion about abortion itself, everyone I talked to all agreed that there's more the government could do to prevent unsafe abortions. Women shouldn't feel as if their only choice is to harm their own bodies and get surgery. Instead, there should be changes to the country's sex education and policies that help women who feel as if they can't raise their own child. It shouldn't just be up to women to carry this burden. Whatever reason that might be, the government should be making sure that this individual can make a safe choice. Just like the rest of the world, South Korea is still trying to look for a solution for this complex issue. But amid the current legal limbo, women still can't say for sure where they stand or what their options are. Shin Yeun, Arirang News. For a look at the news from around the world, we now turn to our Matthew Ashley standing by at the Arirang Newsroom. Good morning. Good morning to you guys. Hi Matt, let's start in Greece where a plane carrying weapons has crashed. Well that's right, so young carrying 11 metric tons of munitions from Serbia to Bangladesh, a Ukrainian cargo plane has crashed in northern Greece killing all eight crew members on board. Now, Greek and Serbian authorities said on Sunday that an Antonov AN-12 aircraft crashed on Saturday while on its way to a stopover in Jordan. The pilot had requested an emergency landing shortly after takeoff due to engine trouble, but ultimately crashed near the city of Kavala. Meanwhile, Ukraine's foreign ministry has confirmed all eight victims were Ukrainian citizens. So far, one body has been recovered. Now, owing to explosive cargo, which includes landmines, authorities have been using drones to survey the crash site. Now, in the UK, the race for Britain's next prime minister is heating up. Five candidates remain and they laid out their plans in an hour-long television debate on Sunday, clashing over tax cuts, Brexit, trans rights and public trust. All five said they would not call an early election if chosen by the Conservative Party for the PM position. The fiercest clashes were between former Chancellor Rishi Sunak and Foreign Secretary Liz Truss. They came to a head over ways to rein in living, rising living costs while growing the economy. Conservative MPs will hold a third vote on Monday to cut the contenders down to two final candidates. Competing for the title of Fischer König or Fischer King, competitors in Germany tried to knock each other into a lake in a traditional water jousting competition. At Lake Starnberg in Bavaria on Saturday and Sunday, 63 young men and women from the area took part in the 500-year-old Fischerstechen event that saw a crowd of some 2,000 people. They dressed up, sat on wooden planks attached to boats and used long lances to force each other into the water. The event takes place every five years and the winner is the last person standing. And finally, 17 years after calling off their first engagement, actor Ben Affleck and singer Jennifer Lopez appear to have tied the knot. Media reports on Sunday say the couple got married in Las Vegas after restarting their relationship nearly two decades after they separated. 
And according to documents found online, the actor and singer obtained a marriage license from Clark County, Nevada on Saturday. The couple, also known as Benefer, rekindled their romance last year and were engaged in April. So far, representatives for both Affleck and Lopez have been unreachable for comment. Good morning. Southern parts of the country are seeing heavy monsoon rain this morning, while well, right now, south coast regions are seeing downpours of 30 millimeters an hour. Rain clouds will move to the east as the day goes on and will drop heavy rain on Gyeongsang Namdo province as well. And for now, a heavy rain warning has been issued across Jeolla Namdo with a rain advisory in surrounding regions in Gyeongsang Namdo province with 30 to 50 millimeters of rain rain per hour expected through tonight. And heavier rain for further down south today, the coastline of Gyeongsang Dangdo province could see more than 250 millimeters of torrential showers. The rest of the south will see 30 to 150 millimeters along with gusty winds on the south coast. But temperature-wise, most regions are waking up to readings below 25 degrees Celsius, except on Jeju Island. In southern regions, we'll get a lot of relief from the sweltering heat along with rain. Daegu and Gyeongju will be going up to 27 degrees Celsius, Gwangju at 28. Seoul will be slightly warmer than yesterday, topping out at 31 degrees Celsius with a slim chance of drizzle. With that, Here's a look at the weather conditions around the globe. That wraps up our newscast for this hour. We'll be back tomorrow for our Tuesday's edition of New Day at Arirang. Thanks ever so much for joining us this morning. But do tune in to Arirang News for updates throughout the day. Have a lovely day or evening wherever you are. Goodbye.